full of hate. He butters, cries, and a dark shadow falls over the stroll. From the ashes of a once great fandom has risen a meme, an LOL that must be liked. We look to the airways for a vindicator, someone to strike fear in the dark basement of the parents who created him. The battle between fan and smirk has begun. With a head on his shoulders stands the smirk fan, a speaker of truth, with a voice of silence, and a radio show of justice. This is Ring Rust. Speaking of NXT TakeOver Toronto from the Air Canada Center on the WWE Network, uh, there's five matches, so they didn't add any. They don't, I don't think they usually add any to TakeOvers, usually. They'll probably add something, I mean, they might add a pre-show, a kickoff match or two, but journals, but they didn't seem to. What I'll do is uh, looking at the fact that there's five matches for TakeOver, and there's eight matches, including the two pre-show matches, which I didn't get to predict because I didn't know they were happening. So, uh, eight pre-show matches for Survivor Series. What I'll do is I'll take all the matches two at a time. Uh, for TakeOver, I'll just use the... because they got the two tag team matches back-to-back, so what I'll do is I'll read up to the first tag team match, and then after that I'll read the second tag team match and then the two matches after it, just to divide it up that way. Anywho, Bobby Roode defeated Ty Dillinger in uh, the opening match, which, oh my God, the the entrance that Bobby Roode had, that was just something else. I did predict that Ty Dillinger was going to win, so, you know, I got two wrong, not a big deal. You know, I'm not going to go home and cry about it or anything, so. It was an o- overall enjoyable show, and each of the matches were enjoyable in and of themselves, were quite uh, quite entertaining, depending on what you were in it for, I guess. All the matches had something different for somebody different, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. So, uh, yeah, I liked that opening match. The The intro got me, just, just got me. So it's like, oh, that's fantastic right there, that opening. So... And, yeah, it was a fun match. If you haven't seen it yet, well, sorry, I'm giving away the endings. So you're probably not all that opposed to spoilers then. If you haven't seen it yet, you're either somehow managed to avoid spoilers for it all week, because it was last this past weekend, So, or you just don't care. I personally am in the wheelhouse of I just don't care. You know, you can spoil something all you want, and I don't care how microscopic your Richard is for having, having, having to spoil it for someone. When someone says, I haven't seen X show yet, they say, oh, this thing happened. And I said it because there's this many kilometers between us, or miles, or whatever your unit of measurement is. LOL. I've unfriended people over... Just sheer stupidity like that. Just, oh, I'm about to sit down and watch Impact. Oh, Sting came back. The, oh, my, okay, goodbye then. Not that I care about the spoiler so much. It's just that person, their first impulse was to tell me what happened during a show that I hadn't seen yet. And then had the audacity to get pissy with me because I was getting upset over a bad, in their opinion, show. Presumably, they didn't even watch it. They just go on someone else's opinion that it was a bad show. I guess. I don't know. I couldn't say. So, I don't know. Fans say what they want, and then when they get it, they say, I guess, too late? I don't know. They want it right away, and if they don't get it right away, if they get, if they get it a month or so later, they say, too late? You know, it's like, well, you only said it now, and they can't just change gears and give you this thing that you want because just over 50% of you say you want it. 
You know, they have to deci- they have to decide on a week by week basis if what the fans are cheering for is worth changing gears over. They need to observe how it progresses. They don't they can't just say, "Oh, they're cheering for Dolph Ziggler this week. I guess we're going to put him in the WWE title picture." You know, because they might not be cheering for him next week. They might not be cheering for him next month. They might not be they might be booing for him by the time he gets to the world title match. So fans are like that, you know. Well, fans are still chanting for Daniel Bryan. Uh, maybe we should ask him again if he can come back. No, I'll probably die. Uh, okay, we'll ask you next week. No, I'll probably still die. Uh, you'll change your mind. Uh, fans. And, of course, I use I say fans in quotation marks because... A fan likes the thing that they're a fan of. If you're complaining incessantly about the thing that you claim to be a fan of, you aren't a fan of it. It's just that simple. You're a ra- you're a fair weather fan. If you're going to call yourself a fan at all, be sure to quantify it by saying you're a fair weather fan. You're not there for you're not you're not cheering through the dry periods. You know, you're crying through the dry periods. I guess that's your way of helping with dry periods. I guess. You're providing moisture to the dry periods by crying. You're listening to Ring Rush for Ducks on Gerberonology TV. And the second match, the Authors of Pain, Occam and Razar, defeated TM61, uh, Nick Miller and Shane Thorne. In a, the finals of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Tournament, with Paul Ellering suspended above the ring inside a shark cage, which they, they were they calling that a crash cage? Because there was something brought to you by Crash Cage, so maybe that's the brand name of the shark cage they were using. I guess I don't know. Still, you know, that in and of itself, the fact that the manager was suspended above the ring, like literally above the ring, I don't know why. He wasn't, like, suspended just above the floor, but still far enough from the ring that no one could reach him. That was old school, and then they started climbing the the thing that that was holding the cage up, and then were jumping off it. and So, yeah, high-flying stuff and power stuff, and like I said, like I said last week, I couldn't see how a smaller team like TM61 would be able to overcome the Authors of Pain. Because, after all, the Rockers didn't beat... The, the Twin Towers. They didn't beat a much a superior uh, a, a team with superior size and a uh, superior lack of Marty Jannetty's. You are listening to Ring Rust Productions on Gerbronology TV. This is Tyrone Mark Gerbroni. You are listening to Ring Rust. Next up for NXT TakeOver Toronto, 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 from the WWE Network from this past uh, weekend. Uh, for the uh, two out of three falls match for the NXT Tag Team Championship, we saw DIY, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa defeating the champions of the Revival, Dash Wilder and Scott Dawson, 2-1 to one, of course. Revival won the first fall after performing the Shatter Machine on Gargano. DIY won the second fall after performing a running knees slash super kick combination to Dash. And DIY won the third fall after Dash submitted to the Gargano escape by Gargano and Dawson submitted to an arm bar by Ciampa simultaneously. Thus, DIY won the title. And that was something to see as well. That was something that the, the, both members of the Revival were reaching for each other, trying to keep the other from... T- I don't know if they were looking for support or trying to keep the other from tapping, and it just looked... That was just a... If you know what to look for, it looked really silly, but entertainingly silly. It, silly in the good way, in that wrestling is supposed to be entertaining. They All four of those guys were having a good time performing that match. Now, you may say, who cares? But they were having fun in the Attitude Era. The performers were having fun. They were enjoying themselves. They felt... They were able to express themselves creatively in that ring, so it reflected in the in-ring performances. There were a lot of the, especially the mid-card people and the undercard people, so still uh, the undercard nowadays too, 
you know, a lot of those guys were having fun because the main people weren't paying attention to them. They were just allowed to go do. That's why three man band were. Well, I don't. I can't say. You know, they what whatever they accomplished. They didn't really accomplish a whole lot. They were still, you know, way down there. You know, in hovering in the mid card somewhere. But you could tell by watching them, they were having fun because nobody was paying attention to them. So they said, eh, "We'll just go out and have, we'll just go out and do something. Then we'll just go out and make up, we'll make some stuff up, and have a good time, and then we'll make money having a good time." Because who wouldn't want to make money having a good time? You would. I would. I would love to make money having a good time. I'm, I'm getting paid, and I'm having a good time doing it. Why wouldn't I? You know, why wouldn't anybody? So that epitomizes the, the greatness of the NXT tag team division. The tag, you know, or really the, all, the entire, just about the entirety of the NXT roster, actually. They're having, you know, they're living their dream. More so than just about anybody in WWE proper. The ones in NXT are living their dream. They're putting off good matches for the, the vast majority of them are putting off pretty good matches. I mean, if they're NXT exclusives, don't be saying, yeah, but what about Eva Marie? Well, she's WWE more so than NXT. When she's anywhere, you know? You know, when she's anywhere near NXT, she's not, she's not considered NXT, she's considered WWE, but she's in NXT just to flesh out the roster a little bit or get a bit more work done or whatever. So, somebody like Eva Marie, I'm saying, not necessarily specifically her, but, but yeah, specifically her. A lot of people don't think she's a good wrestler, and she's, I guess, not a good wrestler. But there she is, and they're doing what they can with her. They wanted her, and there she is. They can have her on contract and have her just stand there and look pretty, or they can try to do something with her. If she's there just to look pretty, chances are she's not going to be there that long. So, And then so hire somebody else who you'll complain about. Because she's there for the exact same reason. Oh wait, we needed that fill, fulfill that demographic, and we fired her. So we'll have to hire somebody else who the fans will, who a certain segment of fans will also hate. So, radio shrug. You're listening to Ring Rush Redux on Gerbronology TV. And the reverse subject of women who are there just to be pretty, Oscar defeated Mickey James by submission to defend her NXT Women's Championship and man oh man that was I actually was in I gotta say I was in a bit of a bad mood coming into this show I was um, just sort of I came from just seeing my family and uh, not having my family see me because I guess they were too busy talking to the people and um, I left went hang, hung out down at a, a fast food restaurant I was uh, McGaffin their Wi-Fi and their refills and enjoying NXT Takeover, and I was in a bit of a foul mood. Up and you know, I I had I had, there were moments during those first three matches where I was saying that was that, that was that was nice. I like that, but then in retrospect, you know, I enjoyed the show more than you know more and more. But then during this match, what got me was when. Which one happened first? Was Asuka out of the ring first and then Mickey James invited her back in? She held the ropes open for her. Yes, I think that's the order it, went, it happened in. Mickey James invited her to come back into the ring, held the top and middle ropes, like she sat on the middle rope and held up the top rope, which is, you know, something that's an old school spot in wrestling. You know, you, you show your opponent, you're, you're not going, you're showing your opponent, you're not going to attack them, you want them on equal ground in the ring. And you're not going to, you know, be underhanded towards them. So she held the ropes open. What Asuka did was she entered the ro- entered the ring between the middle and bottom rope. Just because. And the fans loved it. Fans loved that Mickey James was holding open the ropes. Fans loved that Asuka didn't accept it and just got in the ring and, you know, they went back at it. And then Mickey James fell out of the ring. And then Asuka held the ropes open the exact same way that Mickey James did for her. Fans erupted again. Mickey James went to do the same thing that Asuka did, and then Asuka caught her, and they just, you know, went from there. And uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey executed a mick kick to Asuka, but Asuka placed her foot on the bottom rope, 
avoiding the pinfall, Asuka forced Mickey to submit to the Asuka lock to win the match. So, all in all, it was a... That match got me out of that bad mood, I gotta say. That was quite possibly... I don't know if I want... I, I don't know if I necessarily want to say it was the match of the night. But I went into it expecting all five matches to be the match of the night. Because it's... They do that on TakeOver. They say, we'll make this match to match in the night. We'll see if we can get the performers to make this match to match in the night. Or whatever. You know? So... And that is how I called it. I called uh, Asuka defending her title. I didn't. I usually don't specify how, like by pinfall or submission or whatever. I don't usually specify that or count out or. Well, who can foresee a count out, for example? So I just say I think this person's going to win, and usually this is why, you know, or because I just wanna sometimes. There was going to be no loser, I don't think, in this match, even if even for the person who didn't win the match. So, I don't know if Mickey James is going to stay in NXT or if she's going to go to WWE proper or if that's it for her. She's going to go work the independence again now that she's worth even more. Because that's what uh, a lot of former WWE, former TNA, whatever stars do. Former big name stars will go to the independence scene and they can make like five, in some cases five times what someone who's just an independent wrestler will make. Like someone who is an independent wrestler We'll say, I don't know, we'll throw some names out, Lufisto or, that's really the only one that popped in mind, because, uh, because last week I had this little interaction with her and other female wrestlers. Uh, well, we'll say, we'll look at, um, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa before they came to NXT. You know, when they were making their names in Ring of Honor, before that, you know, they were making maybe, we'll say two or three hundred dollars, we'll say. Just as an example. I don't think that's what they were making, but just as an example. But now Mickey James, now that she, if she goes right back to the independence, her next independent show, she can ask like a thousand, two thousand dollars and probably get it because why not? So, yeah. So I don't know. I hope Mickey James sticks around. I do like her. I mean, I do call her my future ex-wife for a reason because yow. You're listening to Ring Rust Redux on Gerberonology TV. And finally, Samoa Joe defeated Shinsuke Nakamura to win, to be the first ever two-time uh, NXT he- uh, champion. Not really a heavyweight championship, is it? Anyway, he uh, performed a muscle buster on Nakamura to win the title for a second time, so... Congratulations to Joe on winning his second title. He's only the second champion in NXT to be a two-time champion, like the the arrival are two-time tag team champions. So usually a champion will in NXT a champion will hold the title for a while, and then by the time they lose it, they're ready to be moved to the main roster, or they're you know possibly not going to be around anymore. So. Almost 100% of the time, they're ready to be moved up to the main roster because they're given that title and they're given the chance to show what they're, what they're like as a champion. So, and then they do. They show what they're like as a champion. Fantastic show. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it and didn't like it, then, uh, you're one of those quote unquote fans. You didn't need to like the whole thing. There was something on that show you liked. Maybe you're a big Shinsuke Nakamura fan and you were really, really disappointed in the butthurt variety that he lost a match. And therefore, waving my finger angrily in the air, therefore, the entire show was a waste. I hope you're not one of those fans. You wasted two hours of watching all this other stuff that you, at the time, liked, but then after the main event ended, you suddenly didn't like any of the show. Because I've asked fans... Someone who didn't like the main event of a particular, of insert wrestling, uh, wrestling pay-per-view here. And I'll say, well, what about this? And I'll, then I'll mention, I'll ask about like the third or fourth match. And they'll say, oh yeah, that was a good match. I hated the main event though. It's like, okay, well, you didn't hate the show, you hated the main event. And you didn't hate the main event, you hated the a- ending of the main event. Fans. You know, they just don't, they don't, they don't, they think they know what they want, but then, they get occasionally what they want and then they don't want it anymore because they want it right now. 
can't help you. Then, you know, go, go join a wrestling promotion and book that wrestling promotion you, what you, the way you think a wrestling promotion should be booked. And then, you know, SCFU. Okay? Just do that thing or get off the pot. Hello, we're Grand Ova. We're back. CHMR. This is Chris Jericho, the highlight of the night, and you're listening to Ring Rust right here on 93.5 FM. So we move from NXT TakeOver on the WWE Network from the Air Canada Center to Survivor Series the night after, still last weekend, on the WWE Network, still from the Air Canada Center. And then they did Raw the the night after that from the Air Canada Center. Because makes sense, you know, fans buy tickets to all three, fans save money, WWE makes serious bank like they weren't going to, but, you know... It's convenient. They don't have to. They don't have to go to a totally different city, or even the next city over, or whatever. To, to you know, for Raw the night after a pay per view, they just have Raw the same same arena. Again, I'm going to take this two matches at a time. I'm going to do the two pre show matches, even though they weren't announced. So of course, there's no. You know, I'm not going to count any win loss or whatever against it because I never knew they were happening. So I'm not going to say I didn't predict it or did or whatever. So anyway. So there's a six-man tag match for the uh, for the cruiserweights, which saw uh, and of course because you know they were just sort of thrown in there. I didn't have a chance to really name their tag team, so it's just T.J. Perkins, Rich Swan, and Noam Dar, who defeated Drew Gulak, Tony Nice, and Araya Davari uh, when Swan executed a standing 450 slash on Davari for the pinfall, and then yeah. So they're not really saying a whole lot about the, you know, the pre-show matches and whatnot. But anyway, they were there to, you know, warm people up during the during the pre-show. There was a two-hour kickoff. I don't know why they couldn't just do a one-hour kickoff. The the kickoff was as long as their pay-per-views used to be, as long as Raw used to be, and as a quote-unquote fan would say, with just as much wrestling, LOL. Because there were two matches during the two-hour kickoff, so anyway, it was a fun match. The cruiserweights usually are fun are fun to watch. Uh, I'm starting to believe actually that they were just gonna do like a, a like six-man tag matches for the cruiserweights. It seems to be a lot of what they're doing. They're, well, they're branching off into three into uh, three-way matches now. They just had a three-way match on on Raw to determine the number one contender. For the cruiserweight title, so I'm glad they're being a little. They're mixing things up a little bit. They're not just saying, "Hey, look at these guys." They're just going to fly around in front of you for five or ten minutes, and then you're going to care, and then we're going to change the ropes back again to the original ropes and carry on with the show. You are listening to Ring Rust Redux on Gerbronology TV. And the second preliminary match, the kickoff match, saw Kane defeating Luke Harper in a we don't have anything to do in this pay-per-view match. So, why not? Friday of this year and the first Friday of next year. 
This is 93.5 CHMRFM. Presents Macho Facts. Randy Savage can touch MC Hammer. And the Macho Man once played Russian roulette with a fully loaded gun and won. on Facebook, tinyearl.com slash Ray Rust. Follow me on Twitter at Mark Jabroni and subscribe to Jabronology TV, youtube.com slash fanboy Mark Jabroni. This is Fanboy Mark Jabroni. You are listening to Ring Rust. Mmm, salty. So next up for Survivor Series from the WWE Network this past weekend in the Air Canada Center in Toronto, Ontario. The women's Survivor, traditional Survivor Series 5-on-5 five five elimination match. So uh, we have Raw... Uh, let's, I named the tag teams last week, so let's, uh, let's run it down, shall we? So uh, Raw Dog... Which is Bailey, Hell in a Cell, Hath No Fury, which is Charlotte and Sasha Banks, and Crazy Lake the Fox, Nia Jax and Alicia Fox, defeated NXT SmackDown, because four of the five are known for being on SmackDown. Anyway, Carmella, NXT TakeOver, Becky Lynch and Alexa Bliss, uh, and Married to the Business, because they're married to people in the... Anyway, Nikki Bella and Naomi. And I did predict that the SmackDown team would win it, it seemed like they had more... I don't necessarily want to say they had more going for them. I just... For some reason, it popped out at me that they were going to win. I don't know why, but I did. So, eh, not disappointed. I got to see still 20 great reasons to watch WWE, either Raw or SmackDown. So, yeah, it was a fun, interesting match. I don't know. I, I don't necessarily think I want to quantify it as fun. It was an interesting match. It held my attention for the most part. When it comes to Survivor Series matches, you either have to give them a lot of time or you have to have a lot of quick eliminations because it's there's 10 people. Best case scenario, there's 10 people. Worst case scenario, there's 20 people, which is what we're talking about in, say, 5 or 10 minutes. Yeah. So, I don't know. It was an interesting idea. You know, five tag teams versus five tag teams, five women versus five women, five men versus five men. I guess it works in that way. I, I don't know if they have enough cruiserweights to do a, a cruiserweight Survivor Series match. That actually would be within the wheelhouse of the cruiserweight division, I think. A five-on-five five match. It might have been something they maybe they could have... I don't know. I don't know if they have ten cruiserweights. I'm sure they get from somewhere or other, right? They can have, like, five... People who are in the cruiserweight division and five people who aren't. Like Kalisto apparently isn't in the cruiserweight division because he's on SmackDown. And anyway, Sami Zayn might have gone in there too. I don't know exactly how much he weighs. I don't know if he's within if he's uh, two or five or less. But anyway, so oh yes, and uh, by the way, Nikki Bella got attacked before the match, so Natalia actually had to take her place. So that would still be married to the business, yeah, because she's married to Tyson Kidd. And he's not technically in the business right now, but, you know, eh, anyway. I think I'll still call them married to the business. So, anyway, I haven't seen SmackDown. I saw Raw, watched Raw last night before going to bed, and I'll be watching SmackDown either tonight or this weekend sometime. So I imagine the big reveal is, is to who, who named Natalia attacked Nikki Bella. I mean, who... Attack Nikki Bella. It seems... That's like, well, you know, I'm here and I'm dressed to compete. Because, I mean, I could have just worn jeans and a t-shirt going out to... Or a dress or something. 
or just a SmackDown t-shirt and whatever, pants or whatever. And anyway, but I'm dressed for the ring, so ding, there go my dimples. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm just going to look right past the obvious of what's going on here because I'm big beardo fella and I'm in charge. So wasn't disappointed that I didn't predict it properly. Got almost 20 minutes. That's uh, that's quite the hefty uh, women's wrestling match, especially in WWE. I mean, you see matches that long or longer on the independent circuit, like in Shimmer or Shine or, or Women of Honor or, you know, or NCW Femme Fatale, but any of those promotions or any independent promotion that just happens to have a, a women's match, you know, you see long matches like that there, but you don't see it in WWE all that often. So you're seeing it more often with, you know, Hell in a Cell main events. You know, you're seeing it more often and uh, TakeOver main events. So, you know, you're seeing it more often. It's just not, still not really super regular yet. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll keep happening. And we'll keep getting some nice matches from some nice ladies and some not so nice ladies because they need opponents. You are listening to Ring Rust Redux on Gerbronology TV. So, next up, we saw The Miz successfully defending his, uh, I guess we'll say SmackDown Intercontinental Championship, because it's on SmackDown, and he's exclusive to SmackDown, and he's exclusive to SmackDown, therefore, against Raw's Sami Zayn. So, if, if Zayn had won, the title would have gone to Raw, of course, even though, you know, they said, you know, well, maybe you should come to SmackDown. You know, just in case, you know, we'll keep the belt on SmackDown. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm liking what, uh, I'm liking what the business is up to nowadays. He's, you know, that feud with Dolph Ziggler. He's got that, uh, sort of, a, almost like a mini feud or a behind the scenes kind of feud or whatever, however you want to quantify it with Daniel Bryan. When it comes to Daniel Bryan, that, that means he just, he came with rage. You're listening to Steve Shamar. 93.5 FM, Alliance 787, Cable 942, and via streaming audio at www.cjamara.ca. Your only alternative is St. John. It turns cold, it gets a little crazy in here. They got the knobs and the guns, it's still in the fear. The mind. Oh, moving! Ow, oh, pointy! You slimy. So back to the Survivor Series review, uh, paper review as it were, from the WWE Network in the um, Air Canada Centre in Toronto, Ontario. So next up, we have the uh, the Tag Team Survivor Series elimination match, which saw the team of Raw Cluster of the If You Seek Amy without the me. But anyway, New Day, which was... Uh, who actually wrestled in that? Biggie and Kofi Kingston. So that was... Booty Rudy, or Rudy Booty, whatever way you want to say it, because, you know, Biggie Langston is booty, and Xavier Woods is tootie, because he's got the horn, and that leaves Rudy with Kofi Kingston, so. And, uh, International Powers, Seamus and Cesaro, Bulletproof, Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, uh, Can't Teach That, Enzo Amore and Big Cass, and Shining Stars, Primo and Epico, versus SmackDown Cluster Fornication, Redneck and No Neck, Tag Team Champions, Keith, uh, Heath Slater and uh, Rhino, Hype Bros, Zack Ryder and Mojo Raleigh, American Alpha, Chad Gable and uh, uh, Jason Jordan, The Usos, Jimmy and Jay, and Breezango, Tyler Breeze and Fandango. Of course, I very silly, I very sillily uh, predicted that maybe Fandango would be the one scoring the winning pinfall, but obviously that didn't, because he was like the one, first one eliminated, I'm pretty sure. So anyway, I did predict, though, that the uh, the Raw team would come out on top, and they did when uh, Cesaro made uh, Jay Uso submit. So I did predict the Raw team would win. I didn't really, I didn't seriously, I should say, predict who was actually going, because, you know, because, well, there's a lot of teams. I momentarily forgot which team was on which team. So sue me. So it would have been, would have been humorous, I think. I mean, like I said, I, like I said last week, I could have just imagined his facial expression after winning the, after scoring the winning pinfall. 
But anyway, it wasn't to be. I didn't really seriously expect him to win. I kind of did see Raw having more to gain, I guess, from winning that one or more going into it. You're listening to Ring Rust Redux on Gerbronology TV. And then, of course, uh, the Cruiserweight title match, which saw Raw Cruiserweight champion Brian Kendrick defending his title against SmackDown's Kalisto. And if Kalisto had won, the Cruiserweight Championship and the Cruiserweight division would have gone to SmackDown, which is where it started, I think, in WWE anyway. That's where they had the Cruiserweight division. But the Cruiserweight Classic at WrestleMania 20. You are listening to Ring Rust Redux on Gerbronology TV. This is Fanboy Mark Gerboni. You are listening to Ring Rust. So finishing things off for Survivor Series from this past Sunday on the WWE Network from the Air Canada Center in Toronto. Uh, so let's see, what did I... So it's the, the men's Survivor Series match now. So I called that team Raw Talent because they're on Raw and they're talented in any way. Seth Rollins with the uh, sub-team of MCJ and Cool K, uh, Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens, like MCJ and Cool G from the rap duo from the 90s, and WWE Strong Style, because they need to look strong, apparently, Roman Reigns and uh, Braun Strowman, versus SmackDown Live for the moment, uh, Shane McMahon, Anti-Authority, AJ Styles and Dean Ambrose, and sure, why it not? Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt. I think I came up with a better name last week, but it's like, eh, let's stick with it. So I predicted the SmackDown team would win, and look at that, they did. Almost an hour. That's, man, that's some long matches in the show. And, yeah, so it's, it's a Survivor Series match. You, if you didn't expect a Survivor Series match to deliver, then you weren't watching a Survivor Series match, I guess. So, yeah, it, I got what I expected out of it. Any match that features Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho, I got what I expected from it. So... Oh, and James Ellsworth, of course, was the, the mascot and because reasons. Like me on Facebook, tinyearl.com slash rayrust. Follow me on Twitter at Mark Brody. And subscribe to Jabronology TV, youtube.com slash fanboy Mark Jabroni. And the final match, the main event, which had everybody but hurt, saw Goldberg defeating Brock Lesnar in one and a half minutes. Man, I haven't seen that much butt hurt. Since CM Punk left WWE. It'd be great, you spent time in HD outside and just to have a great time. Get on soon. That's it for another show, kiddies. Check me out on Facebook, where you can keep track of all the news that's right on the mark. From around ringside to the latest concerts. See you at the shows. Later days. This is 93.5 CHMR-FM.